is Rima Nathan, and I am the director of the Claude Pepper Elder Law Clinic over at the law school at FSU. Um, I want to talk briefly just a little bit about why we're here. We are honored that you are choosing to join us today and educate yourselves about what you can do in your community to help prevent elder abuse. The purpose of this day, World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, is to provide an opportunity for communities around the world to promote a better understanding of abuse and neglect of older persons by raising awareness of the cultural, social, economic, and demographic processes affecting elder abuse and neglect. Um, we have a great discussion lined up for you, and I want to. I'm very grateful to all of our presenters and speakers for being here today. But first, I would like to kick off this event by welcoming um, the Attorney General of the State of Florida, Ashley Moody. She, in 2019, um, Attorney General Ashley Moody became Florida's 38th Attorney General. She has been recognized as a leader, having served as a commit as commissioner on the Presidential Commission on Law Enforcement and the Administration of Justice, as chair of Florida's statewide task force on opioid abuse, and continues to serve as a chair of Florida's statewide council on human trafficking. At the age of 31, she became the youngest judge in Florida when she was elected circuit court judge of the 13th Judicial Circuit in Hillsborough. County. She also serves as an adjunct professor at Stetson University College of Law, and although she's a Gator, we will not hold that against her today on FSU's campus. We appreciate her setting foot on our campus here. Um, in 2015, she was also recognized by the National Legal Services Corporation for her significant contributions to pro bono legal service and was awarded the Florida Supreme Court's Distinguished Judicial Service Award. And we are so grateful to have her here with us today. Thank you so much, Attorney General Moody. Well, thank you so much. And this is a, an amazing day for many reasons. Number one, it got all of us in the same room that are focused on protecting Florida seniors. Uh, I know for a fact, because I was out there going through the resource fair, and I know that many of the partners today are engaging with one another and sharing information on what resources they have available. And in addition to live streaming today's events so that so many seniors around our state and quite possibly the nation can see the more recent trends on uh, what is what are the challenges and threats facing our seniors, this is a great way for our partners to engage. Anytime you can bring together everyone working on a common problem, the synergy from that, the outcome from that, the efficiencies of that are, are immeasurable sometimes. So. I'm grateful for those that, that took the time and the effort to put this together. Uh, in Florida, we do that great. We identify the challenges, where we may be missing the mark, where we're doing things really well. And we like to, to bring everyone together and we're always focused on how do we improve. And that's why I love being a part of leadership in this state. How can we be better? That, that is what we should all be asking ourselves if we're in a, specifically if we're in a government or service oriented uh, organization, how can we be better? How can we be more efficient? How can we be more effective? How, in this case, can we better protect seniors? Uh, it has been an incredible honor as the Attorney General, uh, leading so many divisions from the Office of Statewide Prosecution to our Medicaid uh, Fraud Division to our Division of Consumer Protection. As you can imagine, that is a very busy uh, division protecting seniors. It's an incredible honor to protect the folks that spent so much of their lives protecting us, me, our seniors. And I know you feel the same way. And so I'm thankful that I was given the opportunity to kick off today's festivities. I am going to be followed by true experts in the area of senior uh, protection. And you're gonna hear from them today. And I am just so grateful for all of their efforts and your interest. But I thought I might just kick off today's events by highlighting uh, some of the things that we have done in the last uh, few years to, to reach that goal, always improving, uh, identifying where we could maybe tweak our laws or bolster our enforcement efforts or our education or awareness efforts. And what are we doing in Florida to meet that mark of being better? And so I wanted to kick off today by talking about the few challenges and the things that we've done to try and be better, as we will all keep striving to do within our own roles every day. Uh, the FBI recently released its Internet Crime Complaint Center's annual report, and I know all of you kind of brace when that comes down. And why do we brace here in Florida specifically? We brace because we are the second largest state behind California in terms of number of seniors. So I think 
California is at about 5.4 seniors in their population. We're at 4.2, but we, we exceed California in our total share of seniors of our population. And so we know that when there is a gross number of complaints that comes down, we have to brace for that information in Florida because we know it's gonna shine a light on the hard work we've got to keep putting in to make sure we're protecting seniors. So we know that in the total losses reported in that database last year, 80, uh, it increased 84% in terms of total losses. And that's all of the losses reported to the FBI's Internet Crime Complaint Center. And it rose to more than 3.1 billion nationwide. So think about that. We're all putting in these efforts we're all trying to seek new ways to protect our seniors, but we're seeing the losses exceed rapidly. Why would we be seeing that? Because we're seeing rapid evolution in technology, in types of, of schemes, financing schemes, and ways in which folks are getting not only control of the person in terms of a caregiver situation, but also control of assets or money. There are different schemes, they're evolving rapidly. I think that's why that number is going up so, so quickly. And I'll just give you an example and you probably read about it in the last few weeks and you, you probably cringed when you did, but as we see AI, artificial intelligence proliferating, you better believe we're gonna start seeing new and improved scams against our seniors. In fact, they highlighted some where they're already using voice cloning technology to take an old blueprint of a scam. So we used to have these things, we called them imposter scams, where someone would, would call and say they had your grandchild in jail and they needed bail money and you needed to go and you could get a gift card and you needed to tell them that gift card information and that would help solve the problem of your grandchild being in jail and they would trick them that way. Now we have, there's the ability to clone a voice. So it's not just saying someone is in jail. Now it's saying, I am your grandchild and I am in jail or I am your daughter and you're crying hysterically because the grandchild is in jail. So these imposter scams that we've seen over time morph in, in kind of the specific details, and that's true for any blueprint of a scam, but the AI that is coming about is going to make them even more sophisticated. And those that were already falling prey are now going to be presented with more realistic scenarios using voices that sound like family members. So that's happening. So AI is going to make our jobs a lot harder technology as it has uh, gotten more and more common and our seniors are getting on the internet more. I bet if you talk to uh, seniors in your life, they tell you they go on Facebook or they go online to look at, at uh, social media apps or other things. Well, we're seeing tech support scams where someone will get into the computer and either send an email or there's something that will pop up and it says something is wrong with your technology, contact us and we will help you. Well, little do they know they're contacting the scammer who is then requesting access to their computer, who can sometimes remote in and get a, a, a hold of all of that financial data or get them to get more financial data under the guise of they are their tech support. So as we have seen technology rapidly increase and its use rapidly increase over the last decade, we've seen the scam sophistication increase. We're also seeing more use of financing schemes that are deceptive or misleading. You may have read recently about a, a, a situation where a company was convincing someone to sign a real estate agreement for decades on their home, not realizing that a lien could be placed on their home. And no matter if those services were ever used, they would have to give over 3% of the home's value or what it's sold for. And then we had seniors and others coming to us saying, I had no idea I was signing over a po the possibility of a lien going on my home. And as these schemes become more and more sophisticated, we've seen them attached to air conditioning sales. We've seen them attached to water filtration sales. 
all with these high pressure deceptive tactics that they get seniors to sign over on some, some really onerous, burdensome financing agreements. And with the use of cell phones, that reminds me, <laughs> we know that texts, we always knew that emails could present a challenge with scams and those, but now we're seeing more and more texts. You're probably seeing them on your own phone. I think it's called smishing. Am I right about that? Oftentimes I try to use these new terms and I get them wrong, but it's called smishing and they're pushing out these things which we you used to call phishing on computers with email to try and snag someone to get their personal information or their money. Now we call it smishing when it comes out through text. Am I right about that? Oh, thank goodness. That would have been really embarrassing since it's live streaming. <laughs> and I am just on that cusp where you probably look at me and think I should be extraordinarily tech savvy, but I am not. I think I have done a good job of fooling everyone. I'm trying to be as the guardian of our seniors and what they are facing with the new and evolving technology. So the financing schemes are presenting challenges. And what have we done? We have used existing laws to go after these new and improved schemes and these quite clever fraudsters. But when we're finding a challenge in existing laws, we're going back to the legislature and saying, look, we can enforce only the laws that you give us. If we need more tools, we're gonna to communicate with you and tell you what we need. And so I was the daughter of a legal services attorney who spent her whole, whole professional career serving uh, indigent seniors. And it always amazed me and it was heartbreaking to see so many that fell prey to either high pressured tactics or deceptive tactics. And so when I came in, protecting seniors was one of my main priorities. And luckily I had a young lawyer named Karen Marilla who came in our office and helped us out early on. She's now doing work with service organizations, specifically AARP. But what did we do? We went to the legislature and said, these are the challenges we're seeing. We need to improve our senior protection laws. We need to give the attorney general's office more power to go after these, and these are the ways we can do it. So we tightened up uh, some of these laws. We did that within um, our first year, and we just did it again last year. We went back and said, okay, we need to tweak it again. And I think that's the way you, the service organizations and seniors can be helpful to those of us uh, in government is to say, here's where we're missing the mark. Here's where we might be able to sharpen our tools, or we might be able to dedicate more resources in order to better protect seniors. Um, one of the things that we see often, and I mentioned it earlier, is the new and evolving ways folks will insert themselves as either caregiving for the person or overseeing assets. So in our office, we also make sure that we're pushing back and investigating if there's any elder abuse going on in Medicaid fraud, or excuse me, Medicaid facilities that, that care for seniors. Recently, we went after a person who had gotten themselves in a caregiver position and started stealing thousands from the person that they were supposed to be caring for. We've also seen instances, and we went back and, and shored up our laws this year, where folks were getting control of assets and doing so in a way that was intended to deprive the senior from having possession of or using those assets. And I know many of you could tell stories, horror stories, about how that has happened. And so we've strengthened those laws. So it's not just the physical caregivers anymore that we have better tools to go after. It's those that may be posing as advisors or professionals that are getting access to these monetary or other valuable assets, knowing that they are going to intend those for their own or others' use, which is just tragic. So. I am so glad we're having this event today. We knew coming in that this was one of, because of Florida's unique situation and population makeup, that this was something we really wanted to focus on and, and make sure at least during the term I'm in office, uh, that we use this, this passion and tenacity of mine to leave us a be in a better place to go after the perpetrators and offenders, go after our seniors in Florida. We knew with 
with the skyrocketing technology and schemes that we would have to start better educating seniors. So we did two things. We launched a program with consumer alerts. So as we are starting to see a, pa a practice or a trend start to develop, we immediately package that and can push it out so that the groups that are focusing on this can get it to their members. The best way to stop this crime is to prevent them from ever being a victim. So we now have a consumer alert program that is structured and we're trying to use the complaints we're seeing either through our through with our federal partners or through our own uh, activities to push that information out. And as it specifically relates to seniors, we didn't want that to be only using technology. You know, when we came in, I we had a hotline, but we also developed an app that we use uh, during states of emergency. We didn't want everything to be online or apps. We wanted for our seniors there to be resources that folks could take and hand to the seniors and go through it with them. So separate and apart from our consumer alerts, we also have a program called Scams at a Glance. So whether it's Scams at a Glance, Sweetheart Swindlers, that talks about romance scams, specifically as it relates to seniors, or whether it's relating to something that might be done after a storm, a scam or a high pressure tactic. Um, we have multiple scams at a glance that relate to specific types of scams we are seeing a practice in that your organizations can take with you to hand out at senior facilities or as I often encouraged to your own loved ones and friends. That is the best way to do it because you can have the discussion and leave it with them so they can be on high alert if they ever get approached or solicited. So I appreciate, again, I hope you can tell I am excited about this event. Uh, I hope that it continues. I hope that it's successful. I hope the partner uh, organizations get a lot out of it. I know we already have. I've already been engaging with some folks with the Attorney General's office on, on how we can use what we learned today uh, and move forward in a more efficient and effective way. Uh, it's an honor to be the Attorney General in Florida. It is a fabulous state. It is a great state. But with all that is great about Florida, it does present its unique challenges. And this is one of them. And I love that all of the partner organizations are saying challenge accepted. We are gonna meet this challenge head on, head on and we will be a stronger state for it. So thank you again for the invitation. And I look forward to learning more about ways that we can protect our seniors from the experts with us today. Appreciate it so much. Thank you so much, Attorney General Moody. We are so proud of our beautiful state in Florida and also really excited um, that she was able to join us today. So we're going to go ahead and jump into some more education here. <laughs> we're all still ready. Um, I am briefly going to talk a little bit about the Claude Pepper Elder Law Clinic, which is what I direct at FSU's College of Law. Um, just so you all know, we are in the Claude Pepper Center here, and then we also have the Pepper um, Institute on Aging and Public Policy. And together, all of these organizations are dedicated to honoring the legacy of Senator Claude Pepper, who was a very strong advocate for our elders. And so we are working together to continue that legacy and keep working for our elders to protect them. Um, one of the things that we do at the Claude Pepper Elder Law Clinic is we offer advanced planning services to folks who are 60 years or older and low income. And we have a table outside. So if that is something that you are interested in or you have a loved one who you think could benefit from those services, please stop by our table so that you can learn more. All right, so now to get into our first panel event, um, I am going to go ahead and introduce our folks joining us here today. If you want to come up and join us as, as I'm, you can come around this, um, this walkway is easier or up through the steps, whichever you prefer. Um, first, we're going to have State Director of Adult Protective Services, Roy Carr. Um, he is, he's been with the Florida Department of Children and Families and has over 23 years of service in state of Florida government. He's also held roles in information technology, performance and planning, emergency management, and so many other things. Um, it's such a long list here. Um, before assuming the director role in January of 2020, he um, served as a Sterling examiner and as a certified trainer prior to state of the state of Florida employment. He was also compiled five years of experience in private investigation. So he is, we are very lucky to have you here with us today talking about this. Um, next, we're going to have the 
State Ombudsman Terry Cantrell. She is the director of the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program and originally from Cleveland, Ohio. Um, she majored in history and gerontology and spent the early part of her career working with seniors. Sorry to make y'all come up in the, okay. Yeah, we're, we're coming up in a good order, okay. <laughs> she spent um, 10 years working for the Cleveland Chamber of Commerce until moving to Atlanta where she worked for the Georgia Chamber and American Heart Association. Most recently, Terry was with the Alzheimer's Association where she worked closely with families whose loved ones suffered from the disease. Um, she was appointed state ombudsman in May, 2022 and is very grateful to be here. We're grateful to have you here, Terry. Um, and then third, Executive Director of Advantage Aging, Aging Solutions, Lisa Bretz. Um, she is the, the designated area agency on aging executive director for this North Florida area, so for our region. Um, she is responsible for oversight of the coordination of home and community-based programs and services in a 14-county area. She has been working in the nonprofit sector for nearly 30 years and started her career as a case manager with Elder Care Services in Tallahassee, who I knew y'all folks are also here. Thank you for joining us, Elder Care Services. Um, and yes, we are very proud to have all of y'all here with us today. Um, just to go ahead and get started, I want to take a moment to have each of y'all introduce what your organization is and what you do and how you can kind of contribute here today with um, learning about World Elder Abuse Awareness. So um, you want to start with Terry there on the end, we'll go down the row. Uh, yes. So um, it's so funny when I first took on this role, it's, I really didn't understand what an ombudsman was. I've heard of it. Um, there's a lot of industries that have ombudsman. ombudsman. But for the program here over long-term care communities and facilities, it really is a public advocate who addresses complaints and tries to resolve them. Um, as the Attorney General mentioned, we are flush with seniors. We have about 4,000 facilities. That includes assisted living communities, nursing homes, adult family care homes, and over 200,000 beds. So really our work is to advocate on behalf of them uh, in many different ways being present, you know, in the communities as often as possible uh, to prevent abuse. And there's so many different types, as you can imagine. So, thank you. Thank you. Roy, you want to tell us a little bit about Certainly. your organization? <laughs> <laughs> Adult Protective Services mm -hmm. is part of the state's massive Department of Children and Families. Um, we are a relatively small uh, peer program through child welfare, which a lot of you may know something about. But uh, our, our clientele is distinctly different in that we serve any vulnerable adult age 18 plus. And a vulnerable adult, which is one of the first criteria for us to get involved, is any one 18 or older who has one or more permanent disabilities that preclude them from doing one or more of their activities of daily living, self-protecting, or what have. Secondly, um, and we, we, we investigate abuse, neglect, and exploitation of those individuals, but we also get involved in situations where an individual is self-neglecting. Um, rather than a second party abusing or exploiting them, these individuals find themselves in situations that are dangerous to their own health. Um, there are hoarding situations. Uh, there are very often mental health um, situations going on as well as substance abuse issues. So with those individuals, rather than investigating who is maltreating the individual, we get involved to try and broker services into that person's life to mitigate their situation and keep them stable in the community. Uh, we also run a couple of community-based services programs, which are specifically pointed at maintaining an individual who meets a nursing home level of care in their home in the interest of keeping them in the community and outside of an institutional placement. Thank you. All right. And Lisa, you want to tell us a little bit about your organization? Sure. Um, our agency is one of 11 area agencies on aging in the state of Florida. We are funded in large part by the state of Florida Department of Elder Affairs. Um, one of our major roles is operating um, aging and disability resource centers, where we provide access to information and assistance for individuals seeking resources for older adults. We do work very closely uh, with the ombudsman and Department of Children and Families in handling um, complaints of mistreatment in facilities, which is uh, pretty much where we work closely with the ombudsman. And then um, in community, being uh, a residential home environment, um, 
Department of Children and Families is uh, one of our community partners that we coordinate education events. We uh, make sure that people understand the processes for reporting. And in those cases, some of those cases, um, our lead agencies that we have contracts with are the ones who actually go into the home after the investigation um, has been, been completed and resources are um, designated for, for those senior adults. Our case management agencies go out and coordinate a system of care service delivery for them. So um, we monitor that. Thank you. Well, we have a dream team up here between all y'all. Um, so since today's presentation is focused on educating everyone about what elder abuse and neglect is, what are some red flags that you could tell folks to watch out for and, and what they can do when they see those red flags, given the experiences at your organizations? Uh, this is for everyone, to so the whole panel, whoever wants to start, yeah. I think I'll jump in. You know, what? really when you think about abuse, it could be as small and start with something as small as verbal abuse. And so when you think about a senior living in a community, that verbal abuse often comes from staff. And so who is that person that can, who is that person that can advocate for them to address verbal abuse? And maybe it's moving them to a different room, you know, adjusting staff schedules so that they're not interacting. Um, and so I think oftentimes the, the abuse that you see on the news, if you will, is, is the egregious abuse. But it can be as small as you know verbal escalating up to physical, um, and so that is why we work very hard to, especially recently, trying to increase our um, visibility in assisted living communities and nursing homes, because we really truly are their first line of defense. And so we have posters in all of our communities, with 800 numbers, and but it's not just about them calling us to, you know make a complaint or, or formalize an investigation. It's really mm -hmm. us setting up those relationships or establishing those relationships with seniors and we're really trying to focus on that and do a better job here in the state of doing what we're doing. Thank you. Uh, one of the red flags that um, people may not think much of, but really is a, um, a growing, um, I don't want to say epidemic, we just went through one of those, uh, <laughs> but Social isolation can present its own challenges for older adults. It's one thing to choose to be alone. It's another to not have a network of support. Um, so where self-neglect might come into play, you might see that in individuals who are socially isolated. isolated. They don't have somebody checking in on them on a regular basis, um, but maybe a neighbor notices something or maybe they had a health incident that requires home health to come in and coordinate care will often um, to help navigate that situation to make sure the senior knows that there are resources out there to help support them and encourage them to get actively involved. I know we have Tallahassee Senior Center. They are uh, one of the uh, accredited senior centers in the state of Florida that has a great network of services. Meals can be um, accessed there as well as social engagement and counseling. And, you know, you, you think of classical signs of abuse, you obviously think of unexplained bruises, abrasions, marks on an individual or what have you, but it can also be a lot less subtle. Um, it could be uh, an individual who's been normally been gregarious suddenly becomes withdrawn. Um, lack of basic amenities, um, constantly asking for food. Uh, abnormal spending habits popping up, uh, excessive withdrawals, things along those lines are all markers that we look for and encourage people who, when you see those things, to say something and to engage with the Florida Abuse Hotline, which is the gateway through which we can get involved. So I'm glad you brought up the abuse hotline because that leads into my next question. If someone does call that hotline, is what they say confidential? Yes, it can okay. be. There are certain categories of uh, professional in Florida, uh, physicians, uh, whatnot, medical personnel, myself, social work personnel who are mandatory reporters, but you do have the right to keep your anonymity when you make a report. Thank you. Yeah. And Terry, is that any different for your position? It's a, yes, it's a little different. Um, we are so resident focused and we are actually not mandatory reporters. And so many... Oftentimes, the abuse is from a family member, 
And so if you have a, a mother that is somehow being maybe financially exploited by their son, the last thing she wants, right, mm -hmm. is to report them. And so even if we come in contact with it or aware of it, we aren't necessarily um, mandated to report. And that's just something that's from the federal um, but whenever we do see abuse, you know, that is something we, we really work very closely with our sister sister agencies, such as APS and OCA, and refer over to them. Um, so it is a little different. Thank you for pointing out that distinction. Um, this question is specifically for Director Carr. We're wondering, do all forms of elder abuse and neglect fall within the jurisdiction of the Department of Children and Families, or are there some differences that, that people might want to know about? Well, d d distinctly, I've already talked about the uh, vulnerability. The individual has to meet the criteria of being a vulnerable adult. Florida is not a state like some states in the country where by default at age 60, 65, 70, you are termed a vulnerable adult under the law. Um, you have to have that permanent disability that precludes you from doing your activities of daily living. Um, however, Cue me back. I completely just, slipped my chair. Do, does DCS have jurisdiction over all no, forms that, of abuse? That's correct. We do not. Okay. We do not. They have to be vulnerable, and there has to be a relationship between the alleged perpetrator and that victim, in that the alleged perpetrator has to be a caregiver or sit in a position of trust or confidence with that individual or have a fiduciary responsibility to them. Wow. All right. So just carrying off of that, should someone who is unsure if a potential victim would qualify as a vulnerable adult, should they still make a report if they are aware of something? By all means. By all means. The hotline you. will elicit information from them and mm -hmm. guide them and then make the determination and inform them whether or not we will or will not be accepting a report for investigation. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, this next question is directed towards Ombudsman Cantrell. Um, when we hear about really serious cases of abuse, oftentimes it's already too late because we're hearing about it in the news. Something escalated to a point um, that was that was irreversible. So um, that often leaves many of us feeling kind of helpless and disappointed. Like, what can we do to prevent this? Um, are there ways in which concerned citizens can become involved as part of as a preventative effort to try and step in before? cases escalate to the level that we're seeing them on the news? Yeah, so our program really is dependent on volunteers. We have a great volunteer in the audience today, Marshall. You know I have to shout you out. He's been in the, with the program for so long. We have about 220 volunteers that really are the ones that are the face of the program that go out into the communities. And as you can imagine, with the, um, the pandemic, we lost over half of our volunteers. So we're always looking for more volunteers. Um, we are fortunate enough to have a skilled volunteer base. I mean, Marshall is a perfect example of being a law professor and those that are really willing to go out and advocate on behalf of, of seniors. But we really, we're always looking for volunteers. So anybody in here, step on up, let me go. <laughs> Thank you. And and Lisa, um, with the Area Agency on Aging, I know you also have a lot of volunteer opportunities. Do you have any tips for someone who would want to become more involved in prevention efforts? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, in partnership with the Florida Department of Elder Affairs, we mm -hmm. manage an elder helpline, an easy 1-800 number, 1-800-96-ELDER. Uh, we can connect you to numerous volunteer opportunities. One of them is my contract manager over there, Jalen, will help uh, connect us <laughs> to Shine, the SHINE program, Serving Health Insurance Needs mm -hmm. of Elders, who um, that program is very helpful in identifying potential um, fraud occurring through Medicare. Um, so we're able to work with our SHINE program and, and we're trying to help resolve those. Um, but we are always looking for um, supporting uh, volunteers to help support the programs that are delivered throughout our community. Um, we have home delivered meal, meal programs everywhere. Some of you might refer to those as Meals on Wheels, but our home delivered meal program always needs volunteers. Um, it's not just the meal. We actually are seeing lives saved. Somebody might have been down for the weekend. Um, couldn't get up and the volunteer shows up and is able to report uh you know to 911 to get them medical care so we're always looking for volunteers but hope heroes is also a huge program um and i see uh, <laughs> I, I see secretary harris here um uh hope volunteers are those who we can deploy into the community um it really kicked off overnight we had uh 300 volunteers sign up that were deployed to help uh, areas that were by Hurricane Union. 
and um, we are now working on keeping those volunteers actively engaged. Episodic volunteers are always welcome, but the more engagement that we can offer our volunteers, the stronger our volunteer base will be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And could you speak a little bit too about how some of the resources you offer are for caregivers as well as folks who might be undergoing some form of abuse or just some sort of more difficult situation in life? Um, people don't necessarily decide over a period of time, I think I'll be a caregiver. Often mm -hmm. it's a crisis that mm -hmm. has that individual putting uh, being put into that situation. And as um, Director Carr talked about, you know, we need to be aware of the stresses that um, occur in taking on that role. We need to make sure caregivers understand what their roles, what they can and can't do and where they need to seek help and education. We have several partners here in the audience today that provide caregiver education and support so people can understand what their role is, how to navigate the system. And um, we do provide education on how to prevent elder abuse, neglect, and exploitation. Mm -hmm. We need to be self-aware self of behaviors that can actually be uh, fall in the category of abuse, neglect, or exploitation. Would anyone else like to speak on caregiver support or stress real quick? Uh, caregiver, caregiver fatigue is a very real thing, mm -hmm. and we see it a lot because families try and do everything they can to prevent their loved one from going into a more restrictive setting. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times people can't balance the demands of being a full-time caregiver and trying to maintain their own life. And you do see slippage in there. And the department can intervene in those situations where a caregiver is overwhelmed and assist with placement if necessary, or put wraparound supports into the individual's home to give that caregiver respite and an ability to de-stress the situation that they find themselves in. Yeah, and I, I'll, I'll second Roy on that. I just think that um, it's the caregiver, right, that is the best advocate for any senior living in an assisted living community or nursing home. We can go in there, right, mm -hmm. quarterly, weekly, whatever it is, but we are not going to be able to advocate for someone as well as their family member. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you think about caregiving, it's not just the actual act of caregiving, but it's um, it's being available and advocating as well. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So we're getting close to the end of the panel, but I want to give all of you an opportunity to just bring forward additional advice or tips that you'd like to provide the audience, especially when it comes to identifying elder abuse and how to pre prevention efforts. That's what we're about here today, because we're all working together to try and make this happen less often overall, right? We don't want to get to the point where we're hearing about things on the news. So is there any additional commentary or tips you would like to throw out to the audience? I think, you know, it's really about the conversation, right? And and having those direct conversations. If you, if you are detecting or suspecting abuse with the senior. Um, so often they are afraid to speak up. Um, they're afraid of retaliation from a nursing home, especially if it's abuse coming from a staff member. So, you know, probing, asking, tr building that level of trust so mm -hmm. that they're comfortable enough to confide so that the situation can be addressed. Mm -hmm. you know. And, and and don't don't be afraid or don't assume that you're overstepping when you see something that triggers those alarm bells. It's always best to make that call to the abuse hotline or to submit a report online via their, via their web application. It's better to get a set of trained eyes in there than to say, well, maybe I just shouldn't make this call. Um, Sometimes the littlest things can be the beginning of what can be a life-changing uh, interaction with these individuals. Yeah. Uh, on, ongoing um, education yeah. and yeah. outreach events that are geared towards older adults, as well as uh, professionals and lay leaders. Um, we help coordinate that system, and uh, it works well for you know caregivers. There are there are caregivers that are paid. There are caregivers that are unpaid, and um, AARP can give you a slew of information, as can I'm sure the Pepper Center, mm -hmm. on the growing needs of caregivers. So we need to be be aware that that they need access to the education mm -hmm. and support. So working with our community partners is the best way to ensure that. 
Yeah. So it sounds like trust and caregiving support are two very big elements that we can all focus in on here. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to transition over to our fraud panel now, but thank you so much, all y'all, for being here. Yeah. So I'm going to invite our fraud panelists to join me on stage while I uh, take a moment and just say thank you all for being here, both in person and virtually, for those of you who are uh, attending virtually. Uh, my name is Kara Marillo. I'm with AARP, and I'm so proud of this event and so happy that we have an opportunity to work with the Quad Pepper Center and with the Elder Law Clinic at FSU to put this forward. Uh, as we just heard, education is a huge piece of the prevention and identifying and earlier detection of abuse, neglect, and exploitation. So just being here and having this, this event is a first step that really helps in us being more aware and us potentially stopping something before it really gets started. I, I also wanna to touch upon briefly the caregiver supports. 211 is one of our resources that is here for our resource fair. And 211 is now offering Florida caregivers uh, support options. So if you call 211, they can tell you what options are available in your area. Just making that plug for you guys real quick. <laughs> so without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce our panel of fraud experts. Uh, we have fraud and scam experts. We're bringing this uh, panel to you in collaboration with AARP's Fraud Watch Network, which you should have received uh, a a overview of today's presentation, the, bi the biographies of our uh, speakers and resources that are available to you. And the Fraud Watch Network is definitely included in there, so take a look. So I am very appreciative of our awesome panel. Let me go ahead and introduce you to from uh, my left to right. Uh, first, we have Director Victoria Butler of the Consumer Protection Division for the Florida Attorney General's Office. Uh, Victoria it has been working in consumer protection enforcement for 25 years and has participated in numerous enforcement cases involving practice, business practices such as advertising, online services, data security, sweepstakes, financial practices, and mortgage servicing. She currently oversees the consumer protection staff of the Attorney General's senior protection team. So welcome, Victoria. Next, we have Sergeant Lacera. Sergeant Lacera has served in law enforcement for over 18 years with the Leon County Sheriff's Office. That's great. I so, so appreciate your so service. Good. Thank you, sir. <laughs> he, he's also a certified fraud examiner and has been since 2014. He's worked on numerous cases ranging from exploitation of the elderly to scams against Fortune 100 companies involving millions of dollars in losses. And his dedication to victims has earned him numerous local and statewide awards to include the 2017 Florida Retail Federation Law Enforcement Office Officer of the Year runner-up and a first responder citation by the Military Order of the Purple Heart, Plymouth State University Alumni Achievement Award, Committee of 99 Law Enforcement Officer of the Year Runner-Up Award and the Larry Campbell Deputy of the Year Award. Is that all? <laughs> so thank you, Sergeant Lucera, for joining us from the Leon County Sheriff's Office. Uh, and last but not least, we have Special Agent Rice Reister. I knew I was going to say it wrong. I told you I would. Uh, he's actually resident agent in charge, Seth Reister, but... Uh, try saying that five times fast, so we're going to call him special agent for just for fun. Uh, resident agent in charge, Seth Reister, has served as a special agent with the United States Secret Service for the past 21 years and has filled leadership roles in both agency mission fields of protection and investigations. Special agent Reister has been involved with cryptocurrency money laundering investiga investigations since 2015, Serving as a founding member of the Secret Services case team for Oper Operation Crypto Craig, the first successful United States prosecution, 
of a OCDETF designated primary transnational organized crime international fraud syndicate. I'll let him explain what that acronym is. <laughs> And for his team's efforts in pioneering international cryptocurrency money laundering investigations and prosecutorial strategies, uh, Special Agent Reister and the Operation Crypto Craig were awarded the 2019 Department of Homeland Security Secretary's Exceptional Service Gold Medal. So I don't think I need to tell you all, this is a pretty exciting panel that we have of experts that are assembled here on fraud. And before I get into asking them questions and going into some of the, the nitty gritty, I wanna give them a chance to introduce themselves and what their agencies and organizations do uh, in the field of frauds, scams, deceptive and unfair business practices. And if we wanna keep with the order, Victoria, would you okay, like to start great. off? Great, thank you. Um, good to see everybody here and it's quite an honor. Um, I worked with Karen for a while at the Attorney General's office and following Attorney General Ashley Moody's awesome introduction, I don't think I have to say too much about the organization, but we do have a lot of different divisions. We have civil, criminal, Medicaid fraud. We have an intake division, all of which work together to try to help protect uh, senior citizens in Florida. Um, I have with me today some of our awesome team from Consumer Protection, and we are a civil enforcement unit. We are not criminal, but we do our best to handle uh, any issue that comes our way. So I kind of um, disclaim that I am an expert in anything. I'm a generalist. We have so many different issues. You name it, it touches on consumers. We look at it. But uh, along with me today, I have Keisha Wilkinson. She is our outreach coordinator. She's available to work with all of you. She can do speaking presentations. Yes. And um, she's an awesome resource for our office. I have Rhoda Floor as well. She's part of our S senior protection team. We'll talk about a little bit more, I think, as we get into this conversation. And Stephanie Chambers is also our lead on senior protection team and Michael Rowland is an assistant bureau chief here in Tampa, uh, also overseeing the senior protection team. So what we do in consumer protection is primarily civil enforcement, like I said, and we go after primarily businesses or somebody engaged in a business transaction with a senior. And um, it involves deceptive and unfair practices, which can be a misrepresentation, a deception, an omission, in their dealings with a consumer uh, that we look at. <clears throat> but it's a very broad practice. We look at all industries. So uh, hopefully we'll get to talk to you a little bit more about that today, but we have some great resources, I think. Uh, my name is Joe Lacerra. I'm the Sergeant over the Financial Crimes Unit at the Leon County Sheriff's Office. Uh, we have a team of detectives I supervise as well as our victim advocate unit. Um, we use our victim advocate unit to go ahead and help out where necessarily we can't go on the criminal side on all things. If the evidence is there or if there's other things that a senior is reporting or their family or loved ones reporting, we try to go ahead and link them up with better resources on there. So those of you repping, representing organizations here, I encourage you to reach out to the victim advocate unit at the sheriff's office and provide your contact and whatever you can provide to any victims, not necessarily seniors alone, but any victims that you might be able to help. Um, and provide different directions. Uh, we partner up with Seth at Super Service, um, IRS, FDLE, uh, Attorney General's Office. Um, we have plenty of cases that we work together with DCF and different agencies across the state. Um, we do travel and talk about different things, even though our main jurisdiction that we work is what's happening within Leon County. We do help out with other things around the state or with our federal partners or state partners. Um, we do have a good relationship with the attorney general's office and work along with them. Uh, we work any kind of fraud you can imagine, whether your check was stolen in a mailbox to a romance scam, to Facebook scam, to everything. Um, it could be from, we've had low as below a dollar in value to multi-million dollar cases. So wide range of what we work. Thank you. All right, good afternoon. My name is Seth Reister. I'm with the Secret Service here in Tallahassee. No surprises a lot of you all. We do have an office in Tallahassee. We, uh, we are over the panhandle. We have an office in Pensacola and Panama City. Uh, so what's the Secret Service doing? Here? So uh, we're, we're most known for protection, Vice President, foreign dignitaries. 
However, a brief history lesson, we began in 1865, the third federal law enforcement agency behind uh, the Marshals and the U.S. Postal Service were actually signed into creation the night that Abraham Lincoln was assassinated at Ford Theater. Um, we were uh, created to combat counterfeiting after the Civil War. The U.S. needed a unified banking system, and that's when we were activated. Didn't pr pick up protection until 1906. So we're gonna have a quiz after. So remember the dates, okay? Um, so what do we do now? So uh, elder fraud, or I just consider it victim fraud because it affects all ages um, and demographics. Unfortunately, uh, we have adversaries that are very active in trying to get our wealth, your wealth, uh, out of your pocketbook and into their pocketbook. And uh, we can help with that. That's our specialty. Uh, we only have 3,300 agents worldwide, so a lot of people don't hear about us. We're not very uh, big on the PR scene, but we are available uh, locally. If you have any questions or you come upon something that you don't understand, you're solicited by somebody you don't understand, uh, you can call Joe and his team. You can call the Tallahassee Police Department. You can call the AG's office, their hotlines. You can call the FBI, their IC3, or you can call me. Uh, we have uh, agents that will speak to you. I myself will speak to you. and. Uh, we're here to help to advocate and then to uh, attack our, our enemies on a, on a more international nation state level. Thank you. Thank you. So attacking enemies on an international level, okay, that's impressive. I mean, I, I hope that it's apparent from our wonderful panel here that we've got a wide breadth of experience, but also we've got different perspectives from the state level, the, local county level, as well as the national level in terms of enforcement agencies. And I think one of the themes that's been said so far is with everybody saying, yeah, I work with the guy next to me or the lady next to me, is this is a team effort. So each of these agencies and organizations works together to provide the best protection to uh, not just seniors, but Floridians and Americans. So, I'll get off my, my soapbox for a moment, sorry. Uh, I'd like to start off with asking Victoria about the civil enforcement side of this. She touched upon this earlier with some business practices, deceptive business practices. Victoria, can you tell us a little bit more about what that looks like and maybe some of the things that you're seeing emerging from the senior protection team in your arena? Sure. Um, so as I was saying, it's very broad. We have one statute called the Board of Deceptive and Unfair Trade Practice Act, which prohibits businesses, and that includes a very broad definition of a cons uh, businesses that might fall under that, including nonprofits, um, any type of business, and a person who's operating. So they are they are prohibited from engaging in what we call deceptive unfair or unconscionable trade practices. And so we look at, there's a few exceptions to different industries, but we look at almost all industries and all practices can somehow fit under that umbrella pretty much from, as um, Karen mentioned, I did some issues with mortgage servicing during the housing crisis when people were um, having difficulty with their mortgage servicer and getting uh, their payments made or help assisting with uh, revising the mortgage to air condition or um, home uh, contractors who come into your home and try to solicit business from you or, or convince you to buy something that you don't need or do a repair that you don't need or charge you more than they estimated. I mean, we have a, a wide range of business practices and we do work um, very closely with law enforcement because a lot of us do become criminal uh, but our civil doesn't involve the intent to try to steal your money necessarily. If your money is stolen, it could be, you know, stolen, but it's, it's if you are um, charged more than you authorized or the price increases, we will be looking at it. If it's a situation where you're approached like on an imposter scheme and they are deceiving you out of paying money and stealing your money, we will work, we'll work with law enforcement secret service we've worked with before on some of the financial scams because we do get involved in some that are pretty complicated investment scams. So it really is a whole gamut, but our side is civil. We don't put anybody in jail. Um, our resources are to um, just to address business practices, sometimes if appropriate, 
put a business out of business and then seek remedies for consumers as we can. We're not representing the individual, but as, you know, as a protector of the state interest, we are trying to return money to, to people if it's been taken uh, unfairly. And so restitution is part of the relief we can get in penalties. The statute allows us to collect penalties on behalf of the state. So monetary relief and business practices. Thank you. And you're welcome. That's, that is a very wide scope. I mean, any business that you can think of in Florida could potentially fall under your umbrella. And before I move to our, our criminal enforcement experts, uh, I, I'd like to ask you the civil process, does this sometimes, the civil enforcement process, I should say, does this sometimes operate a little bit more swiftly than maybe a long-term criminal investigation into a fraud? Those, because those are time intensive, resource intensive cases like injunctions, for example. We do have the ability to go in and get um, temporary injunctions, um, which can be a good tool for us. If there's a situation, oftentimes when we get it, the money's already dissipated once we learn about it. Um, but we can go in and try to stop the bleeding, stop them from engaging in more fraud against consumers. But honestly, our cases, um, if we're litigating, they, they can be very complicated depending upon the case. Um, and it can be frustrating for our seniors and our citizens and consumers because it may take a while before we're able to. Well, I know for, for immediate intervention, that's always an excellent tool for us to have in our toolbox. So I'll move to your, to your right to Sergeant Lacera and ask Sergeant Lacera, what are some of the trends that you are seeing uh, at the county level and in the state in terms of crimes that are being perpetrated against seniors in particular? Well, I would say there's probably three main crimes. That, I mean, there's a lot of others, but three I'm gonna focus on. Uh, you're gonna have your romance scams. Um, you're having seniors who are, or people in general that are going on in their later stages of life that may have lost a loved one and getting back into the dating scene. And the dating scene has changed even over the last 10 years from whereas you go meet somebody else somewhere. Now it's a lot of online stuff. So you have people impersonating others saying they're somebody different. And that is getting seniors to go ahead and fall for things particularly. Uh, we've had one recently that we actually worked with on set that thought they were dating one of the 10 most richest people in the world. Um, that they met online. Um, they thought they were dating that person and they sent over $100,000. I'm not going to say the exact amount, but a very large sum of money to this individual thinking that they're dating them. And we try to convince them otherwise. We try to help them through the process. A family member is the one who reported to us. So we were working with a family member, but the true victim was having issues coming to grips and saying, we weren't believing them. Well, we try to show that victim the facts on the matter and everything through the research and evidence, but that's where it takes the family to try to go and help us. Uh, we also try to go ahead and partner with other resources on the matter. DCF was involved and others were too, but that's where the romance scams. Once they go ahead and are able to get the victim to believe it, they sell it. And it's hard to unsell it at that point. Um, another one is identity theft. Um, we were talking about this the other day that once you become a victim of identity theft, you might not even know it. Your information is sold on the dark web. Well, when it's stolen through somebody answering questions online, somebody putting something out there, um, malware, phishing, whatever, it's not used right away. It is stored. The best people that are doing identity theft keep it stored for several years because then your guard has gone down. You don't have the credit protection on there. If you're a victim of identity theft, usually put a 90 day alert on your credit to go ahead and freeze it so no new accounts are done. You can do it much longer if you go ahead and go through certain steps, but they know most people don't. So that goes ahead and exposes people to becoming a victim three years from now. And once you are a victim of identity theft, you're a victim for life, unfortunately. So that's where you need to have different reporting services. You go ahead and have credit monitoring and things like that to make sure you're protected. And another one I would say would be through social media, um, whether it is through Scams on there where people are going ahead and putting too much information out there and answering somebody buzzing in and saying, hey, I know you, we went to school together. Real quick, there's about 70 people in here. How many have social media? Raise your hands, please. 80% of the room, easily. Okay. 
How many of you put what high school you went to on there? What college you went to? Where you're from? What security questions do you have? Or your favorite vacation spot? Where have you been on vacation? You put that on there? When you go out of town, hey, I'm flying to Chicago for the weekend. I'm going to St. Lucia. I'm going to Jamaica. You realize all those things that you put on your social media, those are your security questions when you go to your bank, your credit card company, or any of that. All you're doing is helping the processors. And I guarantee you, if I were to ask right now, I'm not going to have you raise your hands, how many of these profiles are public or private, I guarantee you more than half of you are public. You got little things like that to think about. And that does not just affect the senior population. That affects everybody. Um, if any of you are, have family members who are seniors and go on Facebook and you see these lovely 40 questions that will be on there. Oh, have you ever been divorced? Have you ever been married? Do you have a tattoo? Have you ever been in the Caribbean? Have you ever been here? All that is given the information. And if you really look at some of the links on where those come from, all that does is go back to scammers. So all they have is all your information right there. They have all your security questions answered by you. And one more thing I would like to say real quick is it touched off of uh, what the attorney general was saying earlier. When somebody calls you from an unknown number and they say, hey, is this Joe or whatever? Or they say, hey, can you tell me your name real quick? Do you say your name? We do have people do it. That's how they go ahead and get your recording of your voice to call into the bank and do other things. So little things like that make a difference. Or videos being posted on mm -hmm. social media. And I, I think that the, if anything, the pandemic has highlighted how much we rely on social media and online connections to stay engaged with one another. And that, that cyber component is a big piece of where the Secret Service comes into play. And I know, uh, especially Agent Reister, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to catch myself that I'm going to answer to anything. So okay. just go, yeah, watch yeah. out. Watch we, out. Told, we told him to say something, Joe. But. <laughs> <laughs> especially Agent Reister. Um, we know that you're kind of the behind the scenes, the unsung heroes, as you were talking about earlier. So tell us a little bit about what you are seeing from the perspective of the Secret Service with respect to these online scams. So what we see is exactly what Joe said. So um, I'm glad that Joe did that. He gets to be bad cop today. I'll come in with good cop and I'll be scary, but that's as usual. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Um, what we're seeing is that uh, social media is a large, um, for all intents and purposes, it has been good for civilization and bad for civilization. I think we can agree to that. It's kind of a big, untested uh, social experiment. Uh, but for all the good, obviously, there's some bads. And things that we see are that um, crime is not linear anymore. What I mean, the old days of La Cosa Nostra, and there's one boss and whole family answers to him, is not true. Crime is exactly like all businesses now. They're services for hire. And what I mean by that is that the same scammers that are sending out unsolicited ads or, um, hey, uh, I met you last night, what's your name? Or, hey, the questionnaires are not the same scammers that are calling you and they're not the same scammers who are moving the money and they're not the same scammers that are giving a splash screen or an email. So these are just groups of individuals independently operating forming into a union when it works for them and unforming and moving on when it doesn't. So just know that off the bat. And I say all that because when I talk to most victims, they say, well, hey, I got a phone number. I got an email. Isn't that good? Well, no, not really, because the phone number is not a real phone number. It's something called an emulator, an emulated phone number, which means their computer's acting as a phone and can generate thousands of phone numbers that are not necessarily real. Emails are, you know, either stolen or compromised emails from individuals like yourself. All that to be said, that's the technical. But what can I really tell you to help you? I think there's three main things that you really need if you remember anything from this, from this talk that you really need to be aware of. Number one is unsolicited communications. You get a communication of which someone you don't know, and a lot of times it's out of context. If you're LinkedIn, nobody should be emailing you about where you went to high school and what investments you want to get into. LinkedIn should be for jobs only. Facebook, nobody should be talking to you, you know, from another geographic region of which you don't frequent. So Chinese or South Korean or 
Romanians probably should not be getting a hold of you on Facebook. The other one is the use of fear jargon. If you do, okay, we can, if we get past that first, we do end up talking to these people or establish communications. If there's an immediate use of fear jargon or exigency in their communications with you. You have to do something quickly. You have to hurry up and make this decision. Time is of the essence. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Um, that's another flag. And the third flag is, actually I'll give you four, but the third one is a switch of communication. If you meet somebody through some unsolicited contact on Facebook, there's no reason you need to go to a third party app of which you're not aware to communicate with them. You don't need to go to WhatsApp. You don't need to go to Signal. You don't need to go to Proton Mail or encrypted email servers to do this. Those are not how normal folks communicate. And then I think lastly, it would be that if there's any in the communication, you feel that you're being coached or being forced in a type of secret agreement with this person, uh, that would be the fourth red flag. And for all these things, the thing I want to remind you is that call a timeout, right? Call a timeout. You know, nothing is that urgent. And uh, talk to your support system or Joe, or myself, or the AG's office, and, uh, you know, kind of blow that whistle, take that time out, figure out what's really going on. I don't know if I answered your question. But you you did. You answered that and some more of my okay. questions. So <laughs> thanks for jumping ahead. Um, let me follow up on one point that you made. Um, the transitioning from, let's say, Facebook conversations with somebody to another app, why is that important? What's What does that indicate, possibly? Well, so most of the time, I'm going to say most of the time because there are obviously exceptions to all rules, uh, they're going to want to take you from a public forum messaging service like Facebook, right, uh, to something that's encrypted and they feel safer or more anonymized or anonymous using. That would be WhatsApp. It's a messaging service that's in -game encrypted. That would be Signal. That would be Wicker. Uh, they can push you to encrypted email services like Proton Mail, uh, and all that means is that these services they feel they are less vulnerable to being discovered by law enforcement or by the providers themselves utilizing their services. Thank you. And one more thing to follow up with that because it actually happened this morning on a case where we didn't arrest. Instagram now has a mode you can put on for vanishing mode, which means everything is allegedly deleted. It's a deleted for a temporary basis, but it is still able to be recovered by law enforcement through subpoenas and search warrants. But if you have somebody put you in a vanishing mode or erase mode, um, Snapchat does the same thing, that is not somewhere you need to go on. Anything that says vanishing, that should be a red flag to you. Boy, I can relate very much to what Attorney General Moody said earlier. I feel like I should know what all of these different features are, and I have no clue with the vanishing mode, all of these things. Born this morning. It's, a, it's an ever-evolving world, but especially when it comes to technology. Um, one of the things that Special Agent Reister mentioned was kind of some of these themes that we see that should be red flags. Um, the unsolicited contact and the, the fear or sense of urgency that's being pushed those correlate actually pretty nicely with some of the, the deceptive business practices that we see consumer protection taking on. Can you give us some examples, Victoria, of what you're seeing through the uh, consumer protection, or I'm sorry, through the senior protection team uh, with Attorney General Moody's office? Yes, I did kind of want to follow up a Go little right bit ahead. on the social media because that touches on a lot on what we do too, as well um, on the civil side where you might have um, those, some of those apps, some of those questions, it's not information you're filling out about yourself, but you might get like a survey, see what's your favorite movie here, what movie star are you most like, or all those little things are ways that third party businesses are collecting information about you. Now they may be profiling you for more nefarious reasons, but they're also profiling you in some instances for advertising to target you, um, and there may be some information that you want to protect. So we do a lot with data security, privacy. Um, there are a lot of separate laws, separate from what I talked about, the separate and unfair that we enforce that deal with privacy. And there's a brand new one that the legislature just enacted that is going to be even broader that um, will put enforcement in the attorney general's office to help 
uh, individuals secure issues of um, their data and how it's used. So I just wanted to throw that out there. But um, you were asking me about cases that came up through SPRS and your protection team. Um, so our team uh, is there to help give enhanced service to seniors. So we have a citizen services that does an enormous job of taking in consumer complaints and directing people to the right places. But we've carved out of that a senior protection team, uh, which is, uh, includes different divisions within our agency. But our team, which a good part of them are right here in the back, back row, um, they take the time to do an enhanced review. So if we get a consumer a complaint from a senior that has a vulnerability, um, either some kind of mental incapacity or um, uh, physical or has engaged in some really um, serious financial interactions that cause some serious financial harm, we'll refer those to our senior protection team. They review them, they may reach out directly to the consumer, they reach out to other agencies, they follow up on it. They really try to give that enhanced services. So I'm just throwing that out there as a great resource um, if you have individual consumers that you don't need that extra um, help from our office, we have that thing available. But the one case that the AG mentioned and highlighted today about the real estate um, issue where um, individuals are being solicited to sign up for real estate listing services, so they think, um, came through our senior protection. So a, a complaint had come in, they reviewed it, they referred it to our general consumer protection enforcement unit. We reviewed it, we got some other complaints, we talked to a lot of you in this room probably about the situation and how it's affecting seniors. And we are now in litigation in that case. Um, and we we're able to work with the partners and the legislature uh, past laws to help prevent that kind of exploitation and fraud against alleged fraud and exploitation uh, exploitation against um, consumers, a lot of them were That's incredible. So you get a, a complaint through the senior protection team hotline, notice that this is a trend in the state, and then suddenly it goes beyond just this one case to Okay, we've got education. We've got we've got a case to go after, but we've also got to make sure that we have legislation in place that prevents this from happening again. So that one phone call can have a huge, huge difference. And I'll also shamelessly say, uh, if you guys do call the Attorney General's office, Citizen Services, and Senior Protection Team, be nice. They are wonderful human beings over there. They're doing a good job, and they really love and care care for the people that they're serving. Um. We're almost out of time, so I want to kind of going back to what Special Agent Reister mentioned on a more positive note. I'd like for us to kind of go through some of the best practices, things that we can do to prevent ourselves from becoming victimized by some sort of fraud or scam or deceptive, deceptive or unfair business practice. Um, and just because you are closest to me, proximity is all. Uh, Director Butler, or Director, yeah. I would try to be really brief because I know they all have tips. I mean, I look at it very um, similar to what the special agent was mentioning, uh, take your time. Um, so the tips that we see a lot of times people are pressured. That's a, that's a huge um, device that um, fraudsters, scammers like to use, pressure, 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 take your time. There is no reason that you need to or any senior or anyone needs to respond, especially to an unsolicited offer under their time constraints. So um, ask questions, always ask questions, ask more questions, delve deeper, play Columbo. For those of you of the age group that don't remember Columbo, you always ask questions. Everybody thought those are stupid questions. They're not stupid questions. They're really important. Spend the time, think about it, um, ask the questions and then research do your own research there's so many resources out there even if you just google you can find a background on the business but there's bbb charity there's charity navigator there's our website which is awesome and has a lot of resources uh consumer alerts uh like the ag mentioned stamped at a glance uh, we have guides full-blown guides with information about some of i won't go into through each of those but Really, the research protect your financial information. Never give that out on a phone call, any unsolicited phone call. Don't give out your social security number. Be very 
um, careful with all of your financial information. Update your virus security software on your on your computer. You know all of that. Pay attention to red flags on emails, texts, phone calls. That these people, artificial intelligence, are not what they may not be what they report to be, and they are getting really good at spoofing and making it look real. I have one in my phone right now from my stepsister, allegedly, I know it's not, as a link, don't click on those links. They look real, be very careful, reach out, ask them, did you send me something? Are you trying to reach me? Because I don't know what the percentage is yet, but it's gonna get higher and it is often not what it reports. And if somebody shows up at my doorstep telling me that I need a new air conditioner and presents me with an iPad to sign on the dotted line, how should I respond? Yes, that's a thing we're seeing, particularly with seniors, is this um, tablet signature. And you've seen it when you go to like sign up for gyms and all that, but you can't read any of the terms. So you respond if they insist that you sign on a tablet, you ask for it in writing. And make sure that it's not binding on you until you're able to review it in writing. Um, they can email it to you. They should have. We're trying to get businesses to have hard copies right there. So if they're in your home, they have to hand you a hard copy and not make you sign on a tablet without having the option. It's really important. It seems silly, but it's becoming big. The scams they're ever emerging or ever evolving. Sergeant Lucera, how about how about from you? What would you say are some best practices to prevent becoming victim to some of these scams, especially like the romance scam, the social media scam? You've touched upon this already. Know who you're speaking to. If you don't know who it is, treat that as a red flag. Um, pay attention to your surroundings. If somebody says they want you to go ahead and come visit them in a foreign country, that should be a red flag. Um, or, hey, I need you to send me money. I'm doing this job over here, but I really want to come see you and meet you. Well, if you're working somewhere, you have, and they tell you they're making a large amount of money, that should be a red flag. Those are some things we've seen. But getting off the romance scams and other things also is where people call and say they're from your bank. Don't take that for what they're saying. Hey, I'm from whatever bank, and I need to talk to you about your account. There's some fraud on there. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and call back the number I know. And easy way to have that no number without even going on Google to look it up is going to back your debit card or credit card. Call the number that's on there. And you can call them and say, hey, I just got a call saying that someone's trying to reach me about some problem I found. Is this legit? And they'll tell you yes or no. And that's, I've done that plenty of times. And particularly if you're traveling up and down the turnpike, a lot of the gas stations on the turnpike are flagged because of fraud issues. Um, so they have different issues with those. So that's something right there to know about is, hey, what's going on? And go ahead and call the trusted number so you don't fall for it. And a lot of the numbers you can look up on Google, thinking it's the real website to tell you are spoofed websites. And they will pay Google or whatever search engine to have you on the top as a sponsor. And people don't look at it. And it could have one little character different on there for the search address. So that's why I say go on back to your debit card or credit card to look at that because that is the easiest way you know you're calling the real company. The trust but verify method, I like it. And the researching because the information's out there on so many different platforms like the Attorney General's Office, the Broad Watch Network, the Sheriff's Office puts out content. All of these agencies have content that helps educate. So I'm going to uh, end with uh, Special Agent Reister. I'd love to hear your thoughts on best practices, but I'd also like to touch upon something that was mentioned earlier by Sergeant Lacera with the romance scams. Um, there's a term that's used for other types of crime called grooming, and I think it's important to bring up that that factor, that psychological factor, and kind of how these these scams really do occur and how they can be so believable and so harmful. Okay, sure. Uh, so what you have to realize is that in most of these scams, um, we can use prevention uh, is gonna be our best option because your adversary on the other end of that phone line is a trained professional. As much as we take seriously our job, they take seriously their job. So don't ever underestimate that. Um, we have a really nefarious type of scam going on now. It's called pick butchering. Uh, it 
emanates out of Asian organized crime syndicates. And uh, in this scam, it's, it's a lot like the others where uh, someone will randomly unsolicited get a hold of you. Hey, how are you? Sorry, wrong number, but it's good to talk to you. What are you doing? And and it's, it's a mix of an investment and romance scam. It starts out with normally someone of the opposite sex getting a hold of you. Um, and during this time, they, they keep up with you. They talk to you at a very long, long period of time, which we would consider grooming. And then at a point, they offer you an investment. And when you're willing to take on that investment, they go and you get an app that looks all on the up and up. Like Joe was saying, the app will mimic other true apps. So say, let me just give a made up example. This isn't an app, but say if it was Google, it would be like, yeah, Google, like there'd be an I or something like that, that you wouldn't notice the app performs basically the same. And it will say that you have hundreds of thousands of dollars you're making in cryptocurrency. So uh, why does this happen? Well, a lot of these adversaries are using psychological operations and, and military level, uh, not that I'm saying they're backed by foreign militaries, but that type of psychological operation training to groom you. And it's very hard to defeat that. So, and what I mean by that is once somebody, I have a cognitive bias to hear good things about myself, right? I don't ever get that at my house. So, you know, I might look on Facebook. <laughs> so, uh, so we all are like that. So once you open up that conversation, um, it's very difficult to disengage. So let's, let's from the start verify who this is, if it's somebody we trust or a third party that we trust and uh, not get in the situation. But if you do uh, realize that, you know, don't beat yourself up, that these are trained professionals and uh, it's driven by necessity if we're going to be realistic. Um, we don't have to worry about where we get clean water or eat. Most of the countries that are scamming us do have to worry about that on a daily basis. So if they don't get money from you, they may not eat, their family may not eat. So, um, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. So here we have a lot of scams. What an amazing, like well-rounded perspective. This is such a great panel. Thank you all for taking the time to talk to us today. Um, I, I, like to just say if you have been victimized by a, a scam or a fraud of any kind you're not alone and there are a number of resources here to help you not just here but through the state of florida through your local law enforcement agency and at the national level through the fraud watch network and fraud watch network helpline there are a number of resources so you are never truly alone and there is somebody there that can help uh, and speaking of amazing resources, I'm going to have our, our panelists uh, exit the stage at this point. Thank you so very much. Uh, I will turn it over to my colleague to introduce the secretary of one of our amazing state resources. So I'm going to take where I went to high school off of Facebook now. Um, <laughs> I realized I still do have that on there probably. Um, okay, so thank you so much for that amazing panel. We are so excited. We're nearing the end of the event, but we've had some really great information here today, and I really appreciate everyone joining us. Um, to close out our event, I would now like to introduce Secretary Siobhan Harris. She's Secretary of the Department of Children and Families here in Florida. She has served as Secretary for the Department since February 2021. Prior to joining the department, she spent nearly two decades at the Agency for Healthcare Administration here, where she excelled and served in key roles, including acting secretary. Her pursuit of excellence continues at DCF as she has driven a significant people-focused changes that have elevated DCF's work and improved outcomes on multiple different levels. Um, some of those crowning achievements are including um, launching the Hope Florida project, which I, we heard about earlier, um, a pathway to prosperity and the coordinated opioid recovery um, core program, as well as the establishment of the child welfare accountability system. So thank you so much for joining us and welcome Secretary Harris. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. It is such an honor to be joining you here. It is also such an honor to be back at my alma mater. I spent six years of my life here. And even though um, it's been over 20 years, I come back and so much still feels the same. So always, always happy to be here. 
also thrilled to be in a room full, filled with tireless advocates who are really engaged and have a heart for our seniors. Growing old is a natural part of life. I think every one of us, um, hopefully, uh, will be blessed to be able to age, age in place and gracefully. And we wanna make sure that we're doing all that we can to protect them from the harms that you've heard about. Um, it's been great to be able to sit in and listen to some of the great discussions that have taken place, not only on elder abuse um, through physical or neglect um, with the first panel, but also on the fraud side. And I must admit my to-do list for tonight has definitely grown. I will be going and checking every social media platform and I'm pretty skeptical on social media. I have my account private, but you know, one of the things about life is that you're constantly growing, right? Um, research tells us that our brain is constantly developing and growing. And I think just sitting here, I learned a lot. And so I'm, I'm a testament to that today. For, our, for our elders, um, in my opinion, and I think yours too, that they should be cherished members of our society and appreciated for their ability to preserve valuable traditions and impact the wisdom and knowledge that can only be obtained through life's vast experiences. There are historians, there are mentors, they serve as our insight into what was and also help us in imagining the myriad of possibilities of what's yet to come. Unfortunately, there are people who prey on our elderly population and in Florida, we take that very seriously. We're so grateful for Attorney General Moody and her team for their efforts to protect seniors so many seniors live on fixed incomes, which makes the tactics that you've heard about today that much more egregious. And so the AG Senior Protection Team is a demonstration of just how seriously the state takes financial security of our elders. Neglect and physical abuse are also a serious concern when it comes to our seniors. And we're proud at DCF to play a role in protecting them. In the best case scenario, our seniors have loved ones who care for them and look out for their best interests. And the Florida legislature codified this by stating in Florida statutes that it encourages the constructive involvement of families in the care and protection of elderly persons. But for a number of reasons, some I will never understand, that may not be feasible and there must be a safety net in place. Therefore, a number of agencies are tasked with trying to protect our seniors and have duties and responsibilities related to our seniors. But the responsibility for protecting our state's elders does not stop with government agencies. In fact, it's all of our responsibility. And that's why the role that we play in terms of managing the abuse hotline and creating that safe space for individuals to report instances of concerns when they see things with seniors is, is so vital. We see this tool as really an opportunity to make sure that we can get in as quickly as possible to assess the situation, intervene, and more often than not, when we get calls, and I'll talk a little bit about the stats later, um, more often than not, we don't actually see full abuse or neglect, but what we see is a family struggling, a caregiver struggling, or an elder who you know, doesn't have the right kinds of supports. And if you've ever heard me speak before, or you've heard about the work that we've been doing at DCF over the last couple of years, you know, we've really doubled down our efforts in our work on prevention, right? It's so critical to work upstream and prevent individuals and families from entering deeper end crisis. So the work that we do when it comes to our child protection teams and our adult protection teams is so important because sometimes we are that that set of eyes that goes into that home and can intervene early enough before something really, really bad happens. And so again, we take that charge really, really ser serious at the department. Like so many of our operations at DCF, these investigations are often conducted in cooperation with partners like the Agency for Healthcare Administration, the Attorney General's Office, local law enforcement, and the State Attorney's Office. By working together, we can ensure that the senior in question receives the services that they need 
and that justice is served when there's criminal activity. In the last 12 months, the department has served nearly 33,000 clients over the age of 60 through our investigations process. Only 19%, a little more than 6,000 of those cases actually had a verified finding of abuse or neglect. The second most common finding at 14% was related to inadequate supervision, followed by exploitation, which occurs in about 11% of verified cases. Again, as I stated, more often than not, what, what we find is a struggling family or an individual in need of help. I talked about those cases of self neglect. We actually had a retreat with a lot of my senior leaders about a year and a half ago. And what we really um, embarked on, especially in, with cases of self neglect of elders, is the need to really wrap more behavioral health supports around them to help them through that difficult phase. And so we're constantly thinking about different strategies, newer strategies that we can deploy to help support our seniors. We know that the referrals that are made are vital. We made over 15,000 referrals for services, both within and external to DCF within the last year. We also work with other partners like the Department of Elder Affairs to offer in-home supports and services, such as Meals on Wheels, um, and we've pursued grants also to increase the amount of services that we're able to offer. Often a senior is, is capable of living independently, but cannot afford rent or other necessary repairs to make their homes safe. There's also a special program that I wanna highlight that has a dedicated initiative to serving our seniors. First Lady Casey DeSantis launched the Hope Florida program in September of 2021, initially within DCF, to unite the private sector, faith institutions, nonprofits, and government entities to maximize resources and uncover opportunities for Floridians in need, but also to break down the silos among all of those different organizations. The secret sauce is the Hope Navigators whose sole focus is getting to the root of an individual or family's needs and identifying local partners to help them overcome barriers in preventing them from living the American dream. Last summer, you guys heard a little bit about it a minute ago, this initiative was expanded to the Department of Elder Affairs, along with the state's 11 area agencies on aging, having established its own Hope Navigators, also called Hope Heroes, who provide these critical connections for seniors and caregivers, giving seniors direct access to help locating immediate needs. This incredible program has already had an incredible impact on Floridians of all ages. Just at DCF, we've served over 60,000 people in our state. I encourage you to learn more about this specific program within DCF, within DOEA, by going to www.helpcreatehope.com. We're grateful to all of the partners who aid us in our efforts. And I hope it's evident that the state of Florida is maximizing opportunities for collaboration amongst our human service agencies. From the very beginning, Governor and First Lady DeSantis have set the expectation really high in terms of um, leading by example with their passionate advocacy for the people of our state and relentless pursuit of bold and innovative approaches to public service. I'm appreciative of everyone joining us this, this afternoon, everyone who helped in planning, also in attending, and who continue to advocate in this space. I also want to give a huge shout out and thanks to my DCF APS team. They are definitely small but mighty. Uh, so elder abuse prevention, as you've heard earlier, is a lot about education and awareness and everyone can help. You often hear the term, see something, say something related to human trafficking, but that saying is equally applicable in this space. We all are surrounded by elders every single day. If you see something that seems off, that seems suspicious, you have a gut feeling that that elder is not being taken care of well, or they seem like they're struggling and just in need of some real help before something really bad happens. Be the change, be the difference by making that critical phone, phone call. 
With that, um, I want to remind you of our abuse hotline number. Roy may have already shared it, but I'd be remiss if I didn't. Our abuse hotline is 1-800-962-2873 or 1-800-96-ABUSE. Again, if you see something, please call us. Together, we can ensure that our elderly population in the state continue to be safe. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Secretary Harris. That was an amazing and also a great way for us to close this program with a call to action. If you see something, say something. And as First Lady DeSantis has created the No Wrong Door policy, reach out to any of these programs or organizations or agencies you've heard from. If it's not the right place, they'll get you to it. So thank you so much for everyone who has joined us. Thank you to our amazing presenters. Secretary Harris, thank you for being here. To our panelists who were fantastic, both panels, we very much appreciate you. Um, and we thank everybody who has joined us virtually. And we will be saying, have a wonderful rest of your day for those who are joining us virtually. And we are also, we're gonna have snacks in the Claude Pepper Museum, which if you have not visited the Claude Pepper Museum yet, now is a great opportunity to, but it's also open every day of the week. Um, and you can learn a lot about Claude Pepper's history. Um, and also please, I know we've talked about abuse a lot today. One of the best ways to avoid abuse is advanced planning. So I just wanna plug the Elder Law Clinic one more time. Um, even if you are not low income or of six, 60 years old, we can still talk to you and get you connected with other folks who might be able to help you. So we really want to encourage people to reach out for those legal services. And make sure to keep track of this handout. I don't know if anybody is still on virtually, but this was handed out virtually as well. Secretary Harris, I'm proud to say that on the front page is how to report to the DCF abuse hotline. Um, and there are another, there are a host of other amazing resources here. So keep this with you. If you didn't get one, they're on the way out. Thank you so very much. Please join us for refreshments. Uh, and thank you for braving the weather, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank for that. you. Yeah. <laughs>